Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here. Go Bears! Woo! Yes! So I will be talking about how we can maximize social value today. Um, okay, so let's just start off by saying that we get so much value from all of our social connections. If you think about all the most important and meaningful moments in your life, probably they involve some sort of social connection. You have your amazing Haas community, all these people sitting around you right now. Some of you have, you know, your romantic partners. These couples are getting married uh, right at Haas there. I love that. Some of you have your families. My daughter here is with me. Say hi, everyone. Cordelia. Hi. <laughs> I was trying to make her wear a cow hat, but it's not sticking, but we're going to get there. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, your online communities are looking a little bit different these days with the pandemic ho hopefully wrapping up. We'll see. Um, but, you know, this was my last family reunion that I had. Uh, definitely looked a little bit different. Uh, my my 97-year-old grandmother there, that man with the, like, beard that looks like a lumberjack, that's my twin brother. All right, some of you, I know, <laughs> he lives in San Mateo. Uh, some of you are having a lot of meetings, you know, where you're maybe not wearing pants like this. A lot of your, you know, social media communities. Um, I just taught a leadership class in the EW MBA program. It was amazing, but, you know, a lot of that was on Slack. It was a fully virtual class. I was teaching in a virtual classroom, which was amazing. Um, a lot of, like, adapting happening there. But, you know, things are looking a bit different. Um, but still, uh, our, our, our social connections are a big source of value, even in this kind of context. Now, I'm going to argue, however, that we don't always maximize uh, social value, that we could actually do better than what we're doing. All right, and so there's three different ways I think we can do better. Um, oh, uh, so before I get to that, let me just kind of make the point that um, we're actually in a world where there's a lot of social divides. Right? And so when you think about social divides, probably you're thinking about uh, intergroup conflict, like maybe you're thinking about Palestinians and Israelis, or in this country we've got you know, a lot of divides, there's race divides, there's conservatives, there's liberals. But actually what I'll argue is that from kind of a research perspective, it all fundamentally starts at this kind of one simple level, which is that there's a divide between yourself and everyone else. So if you just turn to the person sitting next to you in the audience today and make eye contact with them, some of you are smiling, some of you, some of you are not. That's kind of awkward. What are they thinking? What's that person thinking? I don't know. You don't know? You don't know? The reason you don't know is because unlike this really weird image where the heads, you know, the minds are connected, ultimately we can't directly read each other's minds. Okay, so that's where the divide starts, the fact that we don't have perfect access into each other's minds. Now, maybe we don't want perfect access because wouldn't it be like a nightmare to be able to read every single thing that the person sitting next to you is thinking about you or whatever else? Um, but the fact that we don't have perfect access also causes some issues, all right? Sometimes we have to, you know, we have to do a lot of inference. We have to guess. We have to engage in all this guesswork to figure out what other people are thinking and feeling and how should we engage with them and how do we interact with them. And we get a lot of things wrong. Okay, so here are the three areas uh, where I think we can gain some social value. Um, and a lot of these, all, they all derive from this, this fundamental gap between the self and others. Okay, so the first area is that um, we don't do, I think, a good enough job at making those minimal connections. All right, so minimal connections, I'm not talking about your spouse or your family. I'm talking about uh, the, the people that you don't know in the room here today. Okay, so they're strangers to you, or maybe they're just acquaintances. I think there's more we can do to capitalize on those connections. All right, and so this is going to uh, affect your own well-being. We can improve our own well-being. All right, the second area is uh, pro-social gestures. All right, so I think there's a lot of times when we refrain from being pro-social towards others because we're nervous about how to land and other things. All right, we don't think that you know, it's going to be necessarily appreciated, and in fact it is. That should be number two. Sorry, some of the uh, numbers got a little bit off there. All right, and so that's something that will affect uh, communal well-being, that can improve communal well-being. And then this would be number three, <laughs> the third thing, um, being more productive in the way that we disagree with others. Okay, a lot of people are afraid of disagreement and conflict. We live in a very conflict-avoidant society, and I think we can do better there. All right, and so we can actually improve our own and others' productivity there. All right, so let's start with the minimal connections. Okay, let's see there. All right, surprisingly pleasant minimal connections. Let's start with this amazing quote by Aristotle. Many of you have probably heard this quote, at least the first sentence. Man and woman here is by nature a social animal. 
Has anyone heard that quote? Sound familiar? Yes. OK, did you know the rest of it, though? Anyone who does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. It's like a very uniquely human thing to, to engage in society. And most of you, I think, are very, very social, so this is good. Good news. All right, but here are some times when we don't like socializing. All right, here's a picture of when we don't like socializing. When you're on the train, you're commuting somewhere, you're surrounded by strangers, you're doing everything that you possibly can to avoid them, you're putting on your headphones, you're not making eye contact, you're looking at your phone, okay? And so those are the types of things that people don't really enjoy doing. Okay, so um, I am an experimentalist, I'm a researcher, so I get to share some research with you. And one of the things I do is I run a lot of experiments where I, I force people to socialize. Okay, so let me talk about some of these experiments. We run them on trains and buses. We've done it in cabs and Ubers and Lyfts now. We've done it on planes. And so let me tell you what these experiments look like. Okay, so we, um, we basically, we'll talk about the one in the trains. So we, we set up in a train station, and we have commuters that are coming by to catch their train, and as they come by, we say, ma'am, would you be willing to help us out with a study today? And we'll give you $5 and a Starbucks gift card. Okay, we'll give you something. We'll give you a gift card usually. Um, and to do the study, you might have to do something on the train today. All right, now some people don't stop, but some people stop like, okay, I'm curious. You know, you, you look like a nice person from UC Berkeley who wants to run some research. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm interested. I'll, ch I'll check it out. So I was like, okay, here's the gift card. Now you have to agree to do something today. So sign these forms saying that you're going to agree to do it. And then they say, okay, I, I'll try it. I'll try to do something. And then we randomize them into one of three different experimental conditions. Okay, so here's the first condition that just showed up right away. All right, that's the solitude condition. So we'll say, okay, please, ma'am, just try to keep to yourself today and enjoy your solitude on the train. Take this time to sit alone with your thoughts. All right, the second experimental condition is the control condition. Okay, do what you would normally do. Don't make any changes to your normal travel. All right, and then finally, we've got the connection condition. Please have a conversation with another person on the train today. Try to make a connection. Okay, all right, so now there's a sample of participants that we collect that doesn't actually have to do those things. We just have them make predictions about what it would be like if they did those things. All right, so first, let's look at the predictions. Okay, so on the y-axis, you have their predictions about pleasantness. Now, we, we have them make predictions about a bunch of things, but I'll show you pleasantness. All right, so they're, they're circling numbers on a survey about how pleasant they think it would be to be in these different conditions. All right, and so here's what they say. They say that, well, solitude in the control condition, that'll be pretty pleasant. All right, presumably the solitude condition is kind of what they normally do. Most people aren't really talking in these situations. So, okay, that's pretty pleasant. Now, the connection condition, that's not going to be very pleasant. Okay, that's going to be pretty unpleasant, right? All right, now then, what happens when we actually make them do it, and then at the end of their train commute, they fill out a survey and report the same things? It looks different. <laughs> okay, so here, you know, it's actually the opposite pattern. All right, so here, you know, solitude people are not that happy, probably because they feel like not only are they in solitude, but they're, like, being forced to be in solitude. All right, control people, they're just kind of at their normal. Okay, that's zero. They're kind of zeroed out. But the connection people are actually, wow, that was actually pleasant. That was a pleasant experience. And so what we find over and over again across these studies, the ones that we run in cabs and planes and so on, is that, yeah, people say, like, yeah, even though I don't expect it to be pleasant, it's actually surprisingly pleasant. All right, now what kind of conversations are people having? So we collect a lot of data on like what actually happens in these conversations, those people that are assigned to the next connection condition. And there's a lot of variance. All right, some people are having conversations like this. All right, I was, I was slightly nervous, but the lady that I spoke to was very pleasant. We didn't have a long conversation, um, but it was nice to brighten someone's day a little bit. A lot of the conversations are like that. There's short conversations. If you think about kind of the fabric of social, of your communities, that's, that's sort of what you think about. Now, some people, however, are having conversations more like this. All right, it was interesting to actually go out with the objective of being sociable on a commute. This goes against the generally accepted approach. We talked for almost two hours and exchanged numbers. <laughs> yes, and I am keeping track in my experiments how many people I'm like creating these marriages and other amazing connections. Okay, because that's kind of fun. Uh, okay, so now what we're doing, so we ran those um, experiments. We've done it in the Berkeley area. We did it in Chicago. That's where I did my PhD. 
um, but we're actually trying to go out to get more samples of people. And we want to get like really curmudgeonly societies, and we're going to see if even for those, <laughs> even for those societies, does socializing make them happier, all right, with strangers. All right, so one of the ones that we partnered with recently um, is uh, we partnered with the BBC in London. All right, and so that was one where we thought, oh yeah, the stereotype is that Londoners don't talk to strangers, so it'd be interesting to run it over there. <laughs> All right, and so the BBC was really excited about this. They had a whole theme day about crossing divides, and this was part of their programming for the day. And so they gave us access into the tube stations and all of the commuter stations in London. Um, and they even cr created these buttons that said tube chat for the people that got assigned into the connection condition. Okay, and so we ran the exact same experiments. We had people making predictions, we had them engaging in the actual behavior, and we replicated everything. We found the exact same results. All right, and so then we wrote an article about it for the BBC, the, the surprising benefits of talking to strangers. And so we just reported the results of the experiment. We published it in a, pay, a journal. Um, now, of course, we got a lot of comments on this article. And, that's, and, and there were some other things that happened that were interesting. And that's because not only did we find that people did have a more pleasant experience when they connected, just like we did before, but we also still found that people mispredicted it and they thought it would be really terrible. If anything, people thought it would be more terrible in this context, <laughs> all right? And rather than read you the comments on the, <laughs> what I will say is that some black markets popped up of people selling, they actually were making money, so. <laughs> Okay, which is, you know, it's very enterprising, it's very entrepreneurial, but on the other hand, it's like, oh, people are like really mispredicting this, and those mispredictions are hard to change. And you know what? It's a wicked environment, because if you don't ever try it, you're never going to learn that it actually could be pleasant, and you're never going to update. Okay, so, but this is funny. Um, okay, so why? What's the psychology going on here? All right, so one thing that we find is that people are really concerned about the start of the conversation. All right, they're not so concerned about how it's going to go once they get going. They actually think that the other person might be interesting. You know, so it's not about that. They're not so concerned about the end of it. All right, it's more about how, what, what's that start going to look like? And in particular, so one, you know, how am I going to do it? But also, what if I get rejected? What if the other person's not interested in me? We're very concerned about rejection. All right, so I'll show you a little bit of data on this. We asked um, another set of participants on buses and trains, how interested would you be to talk to others on a zero to six Likert scale? And then also, how interested do you think others would be to talk to you? Okay, and so here's what the data look like. So here's the zero to six scale. So people put themselves at kind of the midpoint. They're like, hmm. Kind of, I don't know, I'm cautiously interested. But everybody thinks that everybody else is less interested in talking than they are. Okay, so everyone thinks that, and these data look exactly the same. And the bigger is the gap that you expect, the more unpleasant you think it'll be. Right? And in fact, what we find is that people think that more than 60%, more than 50%, I should say, like around 60% of others that they try to talk to will reject them. Okay, now if our actual experiments are any indication of the actual numbers, that's really, really off. Most people will at least say hi back, all right? Because there's a very strong social norm of responding nicely and kind when someone smiles at you and says hi, all right? But in their heads, people are imagining that they're just gonna be rejected right away. Okay, so this seems to be wrong. This is kind of what's going on here. All right, the second thing, the second area where I think we could make more social value is in the ways in which we're pro-social or not pro-social enough to others. Okay, let's start with compliments. I'm going to give you three examples. Uh, for some reason, I put letters on them. Example A, or compliments. Um, compliments are comp very, very appreciated, particularly if they are um, well thought out and genuine. All right. However, it does turn out that people can't really tell how genuine a compliment is, and they tend to assume that it's genuine. Now, the reason why people sometimes don't give compliments, is that they get caught up in their head and they're concerned about how it's going to land. They're concerned about whether they're going to be able to say exactly the right thing. And they're concerned about their efficacy and how they're going to give the compliment. All right? And what we find over and over again is that receivers of compliments are not concerned about those things. They just appreciate the good intent. They're like, wow, that person was friendly. That person was trying to be nice to me. I appreciate that good intent. I don't care if it wasn't the most sophisticated, carefully thought out, et cetera, compliment. I just think it's nice that you gave it to me. 
All right. And so all those givers are kind of thinking, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure how this will go. And they don't give the compliment. And the receiver would have appreciated it. OK? So I'd say in general, give the compliment, all right? Especially if it's like about somebody's work. OK, another example, gratitude. All right, so Bob Emmons has dedicated his entire career to looking at the consequences of gratitude. And one of the things he does is he has people keep gratitude journals. The way that that works is that the first five minutes of every day, people just write down something that they're grateful for, all right? And in, within a week of time, so you do this for every day for a week, people report that they feel significantly better. All right? And they don't think that, that it'll make much of a difference. All right? But it actually does make a difference. Okay? And then this is a really cool experiment I'll share with you because it's actually very relevant to the context. So at my colleagues Adam Grant over at Warren and Francesca Gino at Harvard, they ran this interesting experiment where they were looking at alumni of schools that were helping out making calls to donors for fundraising. All right, I think this was Warren where it was at. And so uh, these, these poor alums, like you all, making these cold calls to donors um, to try to raise money for the schools. It's kind of a hard thing to do. You know, sometimes you get turned down on the phone, et cetera. And so they had two different experimental conditions here. So in one condition, they just had a room where all these alums were making the calls. And then in another condition, they had the dean stand up and say, thank, at the beginning of the day, thank you all so much for all the work you're doing and making all these calls. We really appreciate it. OK, just two minutes. They just spent two minutes talking, and then they sat back down again. All right. Now the question is, which of those groups made more calls and were more effective and raised more money? <laughs> all right. It turned out to be a really surprisingly big difference. The group that had the dean stand up made 26% more calls than the group that didn't. All right, it took you know, two minutes of the dean's time to say thank you, and it made a big difference in terms of the payoff. All right, so again, you know, gratitude, having this big impact. And by the way, these things are you know, monetarily free. It just takes a little bit of your time. All right, finally, feedback. OK, so I like to quote the former Haas dean, Rich Lyons, here. He would always say, feedback is a gift. But it's a gift, I'll add an addendum to that. I think it's a gift that people don't necessarily realize how valuable it is. All right, so we're looking at context of constructive feedback, feedback that's actionable and can actually affect someone's outcomes in a way that really helps them. All right, so paradigmatic example, someone's going into a client meeting and they are mispronouncing the client's name. Okay, do you give them the feedback that they're mispronouncing the client's name? Okay. Yes, you do, because they want to know that, right? It's, maybe it's embarrassing for a minute, right, in the beginning of it, but that's really going to help them. Okay, so you want to give them that feedback. Now, we've run a bunch of experiments where we look at people's tendency to give feedback. And right, I'm going to show you one really stylized experiment. All right, so these are the research assistants in the experiment we ran. Okay, do you notice anything weird about these photos? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> They have like marks on their face, right. Okay, so there's, so we had a whole bunch of different research assistants and they had some different marks on their face. So one person had marker on her nose, all right, one person had like a smear of chocolate on her chin and then one person had lipstick, a smear of lipstick. Okay, now they're walking around, this was actually done at Harvard, so maybe it would be different at Berkeley, but they're, they're walking around <laughs> and what their job is, you can tell how much research assistants want to be part of my lab to be in these amazing studies. Um, they're walking around and they're giving out surveys to uh, people in the, these are students mostly, some of them are community members, just kind of in the area. And they give, a, they give a survey and they walk through a script, they say, hi sir, how are you, would you complete the survey today, thank you so much. And then if they say yes, they're, they're completing the survey and so on. Now, it doesn't matter what the participant says in the survey, the only thing we care about is whether the participant gives feedback to the research assistant that they have something on their face. Okay, so we collected 212 participants in this particular study. How many people out of those 212 do you think gave feedback to the research assistant? You said zero, Michael. That's very pessimistic. <laughs> You're very cynical. Ten, ten people. Okay. Yeah, it was four. So someone just said it. <laughs> four people gave feedback. 
All right, and then, and we prompt them afterwards, like, did you notice they had something on their face? Everyone's like, yeah. So people notice, it's not like they're not noticing, it's pretty obvious. It's just that they don't give the feedback. Okay, so why is that? I know this is really stylized, but I think it has important implications. Why aren't people giving feedback here? Feels like, okay, it's corrective. They could go to the bathroom and, you know, wipe it off and immediately have less embarrassment. Right, but it's almost like in saying it, you're actualizing it in some way. So people are, are concerned about it. So here's, here's the reasons why. So there's sort of two things. So one is that people underestimate how much others want and appreciate um, um, their feedback and their pro-social gestures more, more broadly. And they also overestimate how socially awkward it'll be if, if anything goes wrong, right? So they, they overestimate the extent and how long it'll last, right? And so that's, that's what we think is the psychology going on here. In a nutshell. All right, the third area. If there's, if there's anything worse than talking with a stranger, it's talking with someone who disagrees with you, right? Okay, ugh. So there's a lot of data that now suggests that we're, we're living in a very polarized society. Some data suggesting it's as polarized or more so than right post the Civil War in the US. Here's some uh, networks on Twitter. All right, and so the blue dots are liberals, the red dots are conservatives, and any line between them is a retweet. Okay, so if I retweeted content on Twitter, um, a line shows up between myself and the other person in this particular analysis. All right, and so the thing you see right away, kind of like, is that the liberals are retweeting liberal content and the conservatives are retweeting, retweeting conservative content. All right, those lines that you see, the, the lines right going between, is the people that are retweeting content from the other side. Now, this particular study didn't look at the nature of the retweet. Okay, so you can imagine that even those lines in the middle might be people like basically derogating, like, you know, quote retweeting to say something terrible about the other side. All right, so, but in general, people are not even engaging with content from the other side. All right. So uh, now I'm going to tell you about a bunch of experiments where we force people to disagree with each other. <laughs> All right, continuing the theme here. Okay, so we're partnering with an organization called Bridge USA. Um, it turns out that there are uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of organizations uh, now in the U.S. that are, are working on this issue and trying to create more productive disagreement. Um, and this is, the org this is an organization that uh, works across college campuses to try to foster more responsible discourse. All right, and so um, they, are, they are part of college campuses all across the country. You can see they're in Cal, right over there. And so we've been going from college campus to college campus, running experiments with them, as they're already trying to have these conversations in which people disagree. We said, okay, we're gonna run experiments with you to do that. Okay, so here's one experiment that we ran at Berkeley. Okay, so we have pairs come into the laboratory, um, and we have them first complete a pre-survey about some of their different political beliefs. Okay, and then we, we assign them, we match them based on their pre-survey to talk to someone that they have strong disagreement with. Okay, now when we sometimes do this in a campus like Berkeley, people are highly liberal. Okay, but we can still find some things that they disagree about. So we have to find the topics where they tend to disagree. All right, so for example, we we're talking about GMOs in the cafeteria, we we're talking about emissions quotas, things like that in this sample. All right, now then we pair people who disagree and we say you're gonna have a conversation with a, another person for about 10 minutes. Now we do it in different ways, okay? So there's different experimental conditions. One condition, they're video chatting with another person, okay? And this is an actual still from the experiment because with their permission, we collect all of their data, okay? And some of them are just speaking. That's another experimental condition. All right, now this is all happening over Skype to keep the platform the same. All right, and then finally, a third condition, they're writing to each other. All right, so over Skype, they're, they're chatting to each other. Okay, so um, predictions before we get into the actual results again. So predictions, what's gonna happen? How much are you gonna understand each other by the end of those 10 minutes? All right, so predictor is uh, not sure. They're kind of at the midpoint of the scale. It's a one to seven scale here. And they're saying, okay, I think it'll be similar for video chatting, speaking, writing. Okay, what actually happens? So now they're done with those conversations, we give them a survey of what actually happened, and here's what it looks like. Okay, so actually it's much better than what people are expecting. They say actually, we, we feel that this is felt understanding. We feel like we understand each other pretty well. You'll also note the pattern is different, right? So video chatting and speaking are just as good as one another. You actually don't really need the video, at least in one-on-one -on -one conversations, we find. 
You can just pick up the phone. Okay, I know phones are not popular anymore, but um, okay. And then uh, the writing condition, things are not as good. Okay, when you're writing to one another, there's not going to be as much understanding. All right, now here's what it looks like for conflict. Here's what they predict. All right, and then here's the actual. So interestingly, people are actually predicting there'll be less conflict in the writing condition. Actually, conflict is way lower than they expect, and it's the most conflict in the writing condition compared to the video chat and speaking conditions. Okay, and then foregone, oh, it shows up all once. So we ask a separate set of participants, what condition would you like to be in? So if we gave them an option, I'm sure they would say, I don't want to be in any condition. I don't want to talk to the other person. But we say, okay, we're going to force you. Do you, would you ha if you had to choose, would you rather video chat, would you rather speak, or would you rather write? People say, okay, I'll write. All right, that's the condition that they prefer to be in, which is the worst condition if you care about understanding and conflict and other things like that, getting to solution. Okay, so foregone productivity, let me show you the, the changes in attitudes and, and agreement here. All right, so here, it's a, one to zero, a zero to one scale there. So anything above zero actually means that the participant is reporting that they've moved a little bit in the direction of their partner's opinions. So kind of nice to see that even after 10 minutes, people are saying that they're moving a little bit in the direction of their partner's opinions across all three conditions, but more so in the video chatting and speaking conditions than the writing condition, right? And then in, in fact, if you just ask them dichotomously at the end of the conversation, did you agree or disagree, what you'll see is that the video chatting and speaking participants are saying, oh, I think we actually agree on most things. And the writing condition participants are like, no, we disagree. Okay, they're not making much progress. Okay, they still disagree. Okay, so um, what's going on here? Why do people want to write when writing is the worst condition to be in? Okay, we have all these different options on how to communicate these days. All right, just to give you some statistics here, uh, for young people, more than half of their conversations, especially social conversations, are happening via writing. Okay, I know this is surprising sometimes to older children, like, wait, what a minute? Yes, a lot of conversations are happening over social media now. All right, and, and people don't seem to recognize the purpose of communication and how to use the different media in ways that will be most effective and productive for them. Okay, all right, so let me go ahead and wrap up and then I want to hear all of your amazing questions. Okay, so we talked about three different areas today. We talked about minimal connections, talking with those strangers on trains and acquaintances, that those are surprisingly pleasant and that people tend to believe that others will be more disinterested and they'll reject them more than they actually do. Okay, we talked about pro-social gestures, those compliments and gratitude and, and giving feedback, which I consider a pro-social gesture. Those are more appreciated than people realize. All right, they're, by the way, completely free, monetarily for givers, okay? And then finally, we talked about disagreement. Okay, and by the way, I teach the negotiations class at Haas, so that is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, disagreement. And I think we can disagree so much more productively, okay? We can create more value as opposed to thinking of things as being distributive. And we have to do it in the right way, though, okay? And in particular, synchronous media. Okay, why, by the way, do we think that spoken conversations go better than those written conversations? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the big reasons is that it's very synchronous, all right? which means that the other person can react online in the moment, and you can hear or see that reaction immediately, and that affects your ability to tell whether they're understanding, and it affects your ability to communicate with them. Okay, so that's why those, those types of media are better. All right, And there's, there's opportunity to create value that a lot of people leave on the table in terms of disagreement. Okay, so I will end there and say thank all of you, and uh, please go out and try to maximize your social value today. You'll have many, many opportunities to engage in all these behaviors. Uh, and go Bears. Thanks, everyone. You want to come up? <laughs> that was so fun. Does anyone have any questions? You could have actually chimed in at any point, but <laughs> yes, please. I love that question. It's such a provocative and interesting question. So he's asking about how do we think about the fact that this is a campus where we try to create free speech. In general, I think campuses are areas where we should be having a lot of free speech, right? It's the idea that we have to have discourse from different perspectives. We want to facilitate diversity, right? Um, but 
There's also a concern about things like safety and other things. Um, and so there is a bit of a balance to consider there. But I fall on the side of saying that, you know, sometimes when I present these uh, data to people, they think, oh, why are we trying to have more productive disagreement as opposed to trying to shut down the side that's wrong? Okay. Why, why do we want to even validate them at all? Why do we even want to talk to them? Okay, I don't, I don't like that perspective. I don't fall on that. I, I think that we need to be listening to each other and understanding each other and that that's the first step and that you have to have a foundation of civility and some respect and then you can talk substantively through the arguments. Okay, and so a lot of like this, what this suggests is that like I'd say in writing, you actually lose that foundation of civility and respect. All right, and part of that is because, so you, let me kind of give you the intuition that we've we found in our studies. If you read something that someone, a politician from the other side uh, says, like let's say, you know, I don't know, Trump or whatever, whichever, you read something, you think, oh my gosh, that person is an idiot. Right, you have like a really visceral, angry reaction to it. All right, and some of that comes from the fact that you're not hearing them say it in their own voice and with their own kind of nonverbals in the way that they would express it. All right, and sometimes you're getting it out of context as well. All right, but you're reading it in your own voice, and so you're actually exacerbating the conflict and the disagreement just from you just reading it. All right, and so if you were to hear them say it, you wouldn't have quite as strong of a negative reaction to it. All right, and we found that in our research. Um, and so you know you get you get a lot more of what we actually would call dehumanization happening over the written medium compared to the spoken and the video media. Um, and so I think the first step is that we need to understand each other's, but sometimes people don't even understand why others are actually standing on things. And we need to have humanization, and then we can kind of move forward from there. But yeah, I think we should listen to other views. You know, that's, that's my take on it. Okay, great. So the first was a research question. He's asking about uh, age and gender and time of day as potential moderators in, in those studies that we ran. And so I'll say uh, time of day doesn't seem to matter that much. We were actually a little bit concerned about, you know, maybe if, if talking makes, we try to look at potential costs to talking. It might make people feel tired. Um, maybe they lose productivity. So maybe they, if they were going to work, some of these people are commuting to work. They don't get a chance to work. They don't get a chance to sleep, right? They're having to talk. And so we, tr we measured a bunch of those things. And what we find is that it doesn't make people necessarily feel like they've been more productive, but it doesn't make them feel like they've been less productive. And it doesn't seem to affect energy in aggregate. Okay, and this is actually true for both, both extroverts and introverts, I mean, which is really surprising, right? So introverts and extroverts predict very different experiences, but in reality, it doesn't seem to affect that much. Now, the one personality dimension that does matter is neuroticism. And the reason that matters is because if you're highly neurotic and you're alone, you're miserable. Okay, so you need the social buffer to kind of bring you back to normal. <laughs> okay, so if anything for them, like, it, it, yeah. So that was the one personality dimension that matters. So time of day, not so much. Um, age, not so much. So one thing we looked at is like, do people tend to talk to those who are similar to them? Yes, overall, so there's a little bit more homophily than not. The way that we handle that in some of our experiments is we ask people to be in the experiment at the beginning, like we went all the way out to the Homewood train station in Chicago, which is like way out in the suburbs, and we got people going downtown to work. And so um, we start there, and there's no one really on the trains. All right, and so then you have to just talk to the person who ends up sitting next to you, so you don't have as much choice. Um, so you kind of get out of homophily there. Now, it doesn't seem to make that big of a difference. If anything, um, there's been some research that's come out that suggests that people have a lot to learn from the, talking to those who are different from them. Now, in one of our studies, it was the, the London ones, I'll just mention. Um, we did find more females talking with females, and that was sort of the best. But we didn't see that in all of the experiments. So I hesitate to kind of say anything else about that. That's a good question. And then in terms of um, trying to make sure that young people, yeah, I think, I think another kind of concern about where America is going is that we're all very, like, you know, caught in our own little worlds, and we're able to reinforce, like we call them, you know, echo chambers, filter bubbles. We're able to kind of reinforce our own views over and over again by the online platforms that we select and other things. And so there are a bunch of different movements now to have 
uh, conversations that are happening more like across the country. Now, unfortunately, by their nature, to make these really scalable, a lot of those are happening online, which is not as good as video chatting and speaking. Right? There are some movements to try to have like phone conversations. So some of this is happening in school systems. And so they're having you know, schools, for example, of uh, students who are in Mississippi and students that are in the Deep South, right? We got like Georgian students that are talking with students over in California and Berkeley. And so some of, the, some of that is happening through some of these programs. But I think there could be more of it. Okay, great question. Yeah, so um, we have done in the Midwest, we have done it in a bunch of places on the West Coast. It seems quite similar. One thing that we're going to do, we're working on it, is going to the East Coast. And so what we want to do is run some, some experiments on the New York subway. So, yes, that's the one that everyone says, oh, this would never work in New York, but I think it will. So stay tuned for those data. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, that's a tough question. Hmm. So he's asking about how do you um, engage with disinformation and what's the best way to dispel it potentially? Yeah, so Keith Payne uh, over at UNC has had some nice research on this. So I'll, I'll look to some of his work. And so, you know, he talks about um, making sure that there's a foundation that's built where you have some understanding on the topic that you agree on certain aspects of the topic first. Right, okay, so let's talk about do we agree on these parameters and let's make sure that we have the same set of facts that we're discussing, all right, because a lot of this, first of all, is like I've heard things from different sources and I have a different set of facts than you do, right? And, um, and then once we have all those and we agree on that, now we can discuss how do we interpret the facts differently. All right, so it's sort of a two-step process and, um, you know, I think it's still work that's being done. It's still in progress, right? Because you can't always change people's minds. Right? I, I think a lot about persuasion and influence. That's another class that I teach. And one of the things I teach for that is that a, a lot of times people think that to persuade others, you want to just directly go up to them and be like, here's why you're wrong, okay? Let me give you all the facts, and now we're done. Okay, no. <laughs> That's not right, that's not the way it works. Okay, that'll never work, right? First of all, if you go up to someone and start telling them your viewpoint and they have a different opinion, they're gonna get defensive and they're gonna counter argue. Right? That's the first reaction that happens. All right, so instead what you wanna do is you wanna build common ground. You don't necessarily even need to go up to them and address them. You might wanna think about using the environment more broadly to influence them, right? You can think about things like social proof, you know, that they start, might start to become influenced if they see a lot of people who are doing something different. Um, you can think about things like um, trying to change kind of uh, trying to change the situation in such a way to give them information that they'll start to kind of update themselves. Ultimately, what you want is for people to come to a conclusion on their own, or at least they feel like they're coming to it on their own, and that's what's going to change their mind. Okay, they're never going to be swayed by you telling them that they're wrong. <laughs> okay. Well, if anyone wants to learn more about persuasion and influence, check out all the executive education classes on it. They're really good. Yes. Um, like, so a lot of this stuff has implications for decision making and how do you make good decisions and not be biased and how do social relationships inform decision making. So I think a lot about social decision making, right, and, and all the kind of dynamics that come up like group think and, and social decisions and um, it's actually interesting. I, I, I hadn't sort of thought about integrating it with this, but you know, if anything, I think sometimes we need to step away from the group and kind of think about how the dynamics might be influencing our decisions and run kind of like what we call rational decision tools. You think about decision trees and multi-attribute scoring systems and things, um, and then kind of reintegrate that with the group. So like a lot of group decision making goes awry, um, and relationships can complicate that. Okay, and so I'd say, you know, actually a lot of these lessons in the context of decision making, you want to think really carefully about, you know, how do we manage the group dynamics in terms of decisions. I guess I have a lot of things I could say on that, but um, I kinda, I'll pause there and say that I think groups are very useful, very valuable. You can make better decisions in groups. You have to capitalize on the synergy of the group, and you have to make sure that you don't get caught in traps of cohesion, like you and group think. Um, 
And, uh, and in order to do that, you have to have people that are willing to disagree with each other, right? So actually that does relate to the final point. Um, what we talk about a lot is like creating psychological safety in groups such that people feel comfortable with speaking up, giving that negative feedback, that constructive feedback, disagreeing with one another, and that'll make the decision-making process better. So, thank you, yes. Remote work is such a hot topic right now. There's so much research being done on it, right? Everyone's interested in it. I mentioned I taught this leadership class with that Slack uh, screenshot from the leadership class, and I have them in this class, at the end of the class, um, propose an experiment, all right, in groups that they want to test within organizations. And everybody this year wanted to test remote work. It was a, well, there was one group that said four-day week versus five-day week. Okay, that one was cool, but, but mostly everyone's interested in remote work. What's the consequences of remote work? What do we think about remote work? Um, the verdict is still out to some extent. You know, there definitely seems to be pros and cons, right? So it's nice for people to be able to have the extra flexibility. Lots of people don't want to go back, right? Okay, I know many of you are probably experiencing this. Um, but on the other hand, there has been a lot of work that's starting to emerge and more of it's being done that suggests that this, the quality of the social connections and the cultures of the organizations are suffering, okay? And you're losing, what you're losing are those water cooler conversations, the kind of casual, the minimal connections. That's what you're losing in these remote work environments because in order to have connection, you have to like schedule it. You have to kind of create this kind of very structured experience in order to have, you don't run into people as easily. Okay, and so the question is, how do we quantify that loss? How do we think about it? How do we weigh it with the potential benefits of flexibility? And uh, some people have come out very strongly. Malcolm Gladwell recently just said, you know, okay, I think remote work is a mistake. We're losing social connection and we shouldn't be doing it. There's gonna be huge costs in the future. We're just not seeing it yet, but they're coming out. Okay, so people are making predictions. I don't know, you know, I don't, I, the, I don't think the data are quite there yet, so I won't comment on it yet, but I, I think there is some loss in social connection, so kind of stay tuned on that one as well. All right, and if any of you want to keep in touch with me, uh, you can always email me, you can check me out on Twitter, you go to my website, and I will end here and say you've been an amazing audience. Thank you all so much.